our guest in the studio today wears two hats. Or maybe I should say it's one hat with two distinct sides. Jeff Kelly Lowenstein's day job is teaching American undergraduates the ins and outs of journalism. But weekends and school holidays find him sleuthing across the globe as an investigative journalist. He joins us to talk about something many of us are familiar with, playing the lottery, but also about the darker side of the global lottery industry. Jeff, welcome to Feel Like You Belong. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, great to be here. Thank you. You bet. So tell me about this industry and how you got interested in this. Well, the project began, Alan, back in 2013. I was working at the Spanish language newspaper, Chicago Tribune. We started looking into lottery in Illinois because the state was the first one to privatize daily lottery operations. And two major companies merged to form a third company that then got the public contract. So we started digging into that and realized that these two companies were extremely influential, not just in Illinois, that one of them is in Michigan, but really throughout the country and really across the globe. And then we also discovered that these companies, they were two of eight that heavily fund what's called the World Lottery Association, a nonprofit association based in Basel, Switzerland, which Switzerland is not known for much transparency. Correct, <laughs> yeah. In financial affairs. So that was kind of the basis of it. We just started looking into it. We noticed that the World Lottery Association said it stands for good values, they care about the, the players, they give the money to charitable donations, the member lotteries. But then we also found out that they got together on a regional and international basis to plan how to get more and more money out of the world's lottery players who disproportionately are poor people. So that was the origin. Okay, and what is if, so my wife plays lottery. Okay. Or maybe not after this broadcast. <laughs> But when we go down and plunk down our one or two dollar ticket on the Mega Millions or yeah. the uh, Powerball, right? What? How does that? Where does that money go? Well, it depends on the state, but basically within the United States, the major good cause that lottery money goes to in most states is education. So the idea is that by your wife playing. She's actually supporting the children. That's because we want to feel virtuous about. It. It's not just our sort of greed, like maybe someday, you know, money will rain down on us the rest of our life. But right. well, I'm probably not going to win, so the money's going somewhere in a good direction. That that's right. And so in Illinois, we looked into that, and what we found was that in the in the mid '80s, about 40 per percent, in other words, 40 cents of each dollar went to education. But then we asked for the data and found that it kept going down, 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 down into the mid to upper 20s by the earlier part of this decade. And in fact, the Illinois legislature put a cap on how much money could go to education. And when the director of the lottery was asked in 2012 why that happened, he said, well, we wanted to have more prize payouts so more people would play, make more money. So that, that sort of got an in into that particular aspect. And then in the subsequent years, we looked at New Zealand. I was there in 2015, Alan. And in there, what we found was they talk a lot about community sports and children, all the pictures of children playing with their dads and stuff. But then we looked and we got the data and we found that a lot of the money from the lottery was going to elite sports like equestrian, skiing, yachting. So rich people. Rich people. So again, it was this issue. We, we, we weren't able to show, they didn't give us the data about sales, but basically we were able to show both in Illinois, and in New Zealand that not only do poor folks of color tend to play more, we found that in Illinois, but there's way more places to buy tickets in poor neighborhoods, often poor neighbors of color, in Illinois, in New Zealand, and in other countries throughout the world. Sure. On this show, we're concerned about issues of racial social equity in particular. So can you talk about how the lottery is often a, basically a regressive tax on poor folks? Yeah, there's, there's been a, a number of different studies in, in the United States. There's been journalistic work. There's been European academics. And then I was in South Africa this summer, and they've actually had two studies as well. And they all show that poor folks tend to both spend more money in an absolute sense, but especially relative to their income. And the South African study talked about what do people give up? What basic household necessity do they give up 
to play the lottery. So that's that regressive tax. And then one of the new contributions of our project was that one of those companies that's here in Michigan, International Game Technology, and in 100 countries all over the world, they do most of their operations in the United States, so they make the money in the United States, but then they take the money from that, uh, op those operations and move it to countries which have much lower tax rates. They take it offshore, so essentially they're implementing a regressive tax on poor folks, but they're avoiding hundreds of millions of dollars in taxes by their financial maneuvers. Because they're a global company, they're not necessarily paying their fair share, say, in the United States. Yeah, I, they're, they're, it, it's important to say that it, at least at this point, after the Panama Papers investigation, there's some discussion about what's legal in different countries. But those moves that they're making are not illegal, but they are not just arguably, but in fact, using public documents, analysis shows they're avoiding six, seven hundred million dollars in taxes from this enterprise that really in a very consistent way has a disproportionate effect on poor communities, poor families, and poor folks of color. So if any of our legislators are watching this discussion right now, what should they be thinking about? Well, the, the South African lottery said that it was going to investigate the tax activity of this company after, they, after we broke that story in uh, South Africa, and perhaps that might be of interest to the legislators in this state, because again, the company, International Game Technology, or IGT, is the same. Has been operating in, in Michigan for many years. Previously, it was called GTEC, but it had a merger in 2014. That's another way that they did some avoidance of, uh, of taxes. So that, that might be something to look at. There also can be a question of really kind of dr drilling in on how many sites there are in different neighborhoods. Perhaps people could look in at where does the money go. It's really according to the will of the public legislator, as that's expressed from the public. Our goal is to put out the information so people can make those informed decisions. Do you look into these sort of psychological aspects, <clears throat> excuse me, of, of how people, why people play, especially people of lower incomes? It, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. I, I, I was in Columbia College in 2014 in Chicago, and so we had a class that was specifically dedicated to this issue of the lottery and so a number of the students looked into the question is the lottery addictive what is the psychology and so the the studies were, were you know and the analysis was kind of varied it wasn't a conclusive result but certainly there were some people saying the lottery can be addictive we've also become aware of some trends where when prizes get to a certain point a lot of people who wouldn't normally play they want to get in in, in fairness <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so th there is definitely a psychological aspect, but the, another part related to that, Alan, I and you were talking about this earlier, the marketing of the lottery. Mm -hmm. And so there is a very definite universal philosophy of essentially saying to folks, if you just scratch this ticket, your life can change entirely. And that plays on psychological desires, but again, the marketing, and again, we didn't study this, but other folks that we read their work talked about how poor neighborhoods tend to have more messages saying, if only you play this, things can really change for you. Sure. So you, you do this investigative reporting. You're also a journalism professor. What are your students learning from this project? Well, the, the project, one part of the project that was very interesting and illuminating here in Michigan was we put in a Freedom of Information Act request to get records of the winners of the lottery. And so the Michigan Lottery came back and said that that request would take more than 2.4 million hours to complete. <laughs> so, so if they had literally worked without taking any time off, they would have finished in the early part of the 25th century. Yeah. So the students learned that you know sometimes these requests, these responses come back. They don't really make that much sense. Well, now is this stonewalling? You're trying to defeat FOIA, or is this a, yeah, it, is this it, a reasonable it, response? No, it, it was, to my opinion, it was completely unreasonable. We pushed hard on it, and we got the data for free several days later. So, mm -hmm. so fewer you know, than 25 million. Uh, yeah, many, hours. yeah two, uh, okay. Hours. So the students learned about the Freedom of Information Act process. They also, I think what they learned both here and at Columbia in New York where I taught this past semester, I think they learned about the process of using data to analyze underlying systems and trends. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, it was really bringing out that there's, there's kind of an organized structure and architecture to 
an experience that someone in Detroit has that's similar to what someone in Chicago has to someone in South Africa, in New Zealand, all over the world. And so I think bringing out that systemic nature from something that's very integrated. I mean, as you said, your wife plays, you play sometimes, you know, we, who hasn't done it at a holiday season, whatever it is. And give them away as Christmas give gifts. Give them away. Yeah. Everybody has a fantasy of what they do. But there's actually a system behind it. There's a small number of companies. They have this nonprofit association that really is kind of a lobbying group. They avoid the taxes. Bringing that out with colleagues from all over the world, it was a very exciting project. And I think the students learned about how you do that as well as the structure that exists. Well, I think once students get an idea of, in, in this particular case, the enormity of the reach and the, and the money yeah. and the power, yeah. that would make, fa uh, frankly, journalism very sexy. Well, I'll tell you, the, the, the scale of the money really was staggering for us. It, 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 according to the lottery's own sources, the World Lottery Association, it, it was almost $300 billion in revenue in mm. 2014. And we, we looked it up. That was more than the GDP, the gross domestic product, of more than 150 countries. So you don't think that much. You just think, hey, I'm just playing a couple bucks here and there. But it's part of this just incredibly large state-sanctioned industry. So basically, Lottery Inc. would be a large country in terms of its, Very large. its annual. Very large. Very large. Very large. In the top 50, project. probably, yeah. in the world. Wow. Wow. So you have a uh, conference coming up soon. You're traveling back to South Africa. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Yeah. The, the, every other year, the investigative journalists around the world gather at what's called the Global Investigative Journalism Conference. This year, for the first time, it's in Africa, in South Africa. So very fortunately, uh, Dean Anzac, uh, Professor Hodge, and Dr. Mendoza all provided support for two students from Grand Valley to go Fantastic. and attend and cover the conference. Uh, we, just, we just selected, we had about 14 students apply. Very tough decision, but Eric Deo and McKenna Piriso, they're gonna go, we'll all go to the conference. Fantastic. It looks pretty likely that there'll be a student newsroom so they'll be covering the conference, wow. it looks like, with students from Germany, China, South Africa, all over the world. So we're thrilled. And, and as part of it, that was one of my goals that I said to the students at Columbia earlier this year, that I wanted to help them get the work published and then go present at the conference. And our proposal to present has been accepted. And so my goal is that in two years, Grand Valley students aren't just attending, but that they're presenting. That's my goal. That's fantastic. That's really great. Anytime you're poking around in institutions that have billions of dollars at stake, some people get a little testy, some people yeah. uh, get a little upset. Is this dangerous? For, for, uh, for us in the United States, it, it really hasn't been dangerous. The, the colleagues in South Africa, it's been fine, but there, there is a colleague in Mali who, wor who worked on the project and he, he explained that there could be some concerns that way, but it was very moving, Alan, because before we published his story this week, I said, you know, are you okay with security? He said, hey, this story is true. And so that, that's its defense. And he worked on the Panama Papers, so, so far that's been fine. We have a colleague in Nigeria, but we're still trying to figure out if he'll be able to do, participate in the project. So talk about this, because earlier when we spoke, you said there was some really, some corrupt seeming activities, particularly in Mali. Well, what this gentleman found, David Dembele, was that the lottery, as you were asking about earlier, where does the money go? It's supposed to go to good causes, to help the people. He was saying he didn't have hard data, but that basically poor people tend to play the lottery more there. But instead, it's going to fund lavish parties for the ruling political party. So his story begins with descriptions of caviar and champagne held by the ruling political party that is, in fact, supposed to go to help the people. Sure. Sure. And, I mean, talk about sort of an inverted tax. These are poor people funding the lottery mm. and going to the absolute wealthiest yeah. in this yeah. nation. And we just, we just had some visitors from Romania because uh, GVSU has a partnership with a Romanian university. It sounds like some colleagues over there will be looking into things in Romania and Hungary. So I really think the project's going to continue growing. So it is probably picking up steam as more people start to discover. Because I'm guessing this organization or this... Nonprofit has its tentacles in lots of places. Yeah, all, uh, more than 90% of the world's revenue uh, is in lotteries that are members of the World Lottery Association. So, and I do just want to mention that the Fund for Investigative Journalism, they supported our project. And that's really important mm -hmm. because 
the gentleman in Mali, the guy in South Africa who spent two months from his home going from Cape Town to Johannesburg. That was all supported by some student travel, all supported by the Fund for Investigative Journalism. That was critical for our project. So if people either want to support your project or just learn more about it, what's the website? Yeah, the website is gamingthelottery.org. So okay. it's a nice microsite, well designed by this gentleman in South Africa, and it houses all our content and we're updating it. So for example, that Molly story, that'll be up by the end of the weekend. Fantastic, well, we'll put this on the screen for our viewers to, to see, and I wanna wish you good luck in this project. It sounds really exciting, and I think something we really need to know more about. No, thanks very much, Alan. It's been a thrill and we're optimistic. We're going to the global conference and meet with folks that we decide what are we gonna do next year. Awesome, making a difference. Thanks so much. Appreciate your coming. Thank you for joining us. If you're watching on TV, stay with us for some tips on American English, culture, and humor. For our friends on the internet, we hope you'll join our ongoing conversation with impressive immigrants who contribute their vast skills to making the United States a better place.